Hey, Leo here for Actualized.org. And in this episode, I'm really excited to be introducing you to systems thinking. This is another one of those foundational episodes, which you will only really be able to appreciate once you complete it and you get to see how powerful systems thinking is. Most people do not understand what this is and why it's so damn powerful. So it's going to take us a little bit of work to get into the juicy details. But I promise you that this will be worth your time, especially if you are on track with your life purpose and you want to ace that. So what is systems thinking? It's a way of looking at the world as a series of interconnected webs, very nuanced, very detailed webs, webs within webs within webs, systems within systems within systems, and all of these interacting with each other in interesting and counterintuitive ways. So systems thinking is about seeing the world from this sort of meta perspective, stepping out of your personal perspective your own agenda or your clan's little agenda and seeing the larger systems that constitute the functioning of our government, of environments, of economies, of the whole globe, and ultimately the entire cosmos. Living systems and also non-living systems. It's studying how systems work, recognizing that there are certain laws and principles that govern systems and that these can be studied and learned through observation and through analysis, and also through integrating a lot of uh, stuff on, in a holistic sort of way. And it's also about studying the traps that befall us when we try to change and manipulate systems. One of the most interesting things you'll learn in life is that when you manipulate a complex system, it behaves in ways that you didn't expect, and that it might create results that are opposite of what you intended. And it really then <laughs> is important to learn why that happens if you want to be successful at manipulating these systems. And that's what systems thinking is really for. It's for changing things that are larger than yourself. So it's not just about how you become successful and how does your family become successful. That you can probably accomplish without studying systems thinking. But if you want to understand and change how government works, how corporations work, how the environment functions, and many other things like that, then um, those are all things that are outside of you, that are larger than you. And then it's really important to learn systems thinking. Why is systems thinking so important? Well, there's a variety of reasons. I already mentioned that it's very difficult to change a system to get it to work the way that you want it to work unless you understand the nuances and the laws and the traps that are there. So that's very important. It's important for your life purpose. If you found your life purpose, if you've taken my life purpose course, then that's something you're on track with. But now the challenge you have after you found your life purpose is, well, how do I accomplish it? How do I have that kind of big impact that I want to have in the world? So that's one real reason why you would want to study systems thinking is because to make a meaningful, positive impact in the world, you're going to be changing some kind of system to do that. So that's your life purpose, is to have this kind of specific impact that you want to have. But then how do you do that? Because you probably notice that the system resists you trying to change it. That's the challenge of fulfilling on your life purpose, actualizing your life purpose. That's not easy to do. So if you want to be a leader, a visionary, a designer, an architect, an artist, all of these people their lives and their careers are all about making a meaningful impact in the world. They need to understand systems thinking really, really well. So this is perfect for you. The other reason that you want to understand systems thinking is actually for your own benefit, not just about changing the world, but also for yourself. Because as I've talked about before, and this is a bit of a complex and uh, geeky topic, which is spiral dynamics. I've introduced this model before of spiral dynamics. If you understand what that is, I'm just going to give a very brief nutshell explanation of it here. 
basically a guy by the name of Claire Graves, he studied how psyches evolve, both individual psyches within human beings, but also collective psyches, organizations, governments, and so forth. He studied this and he discovered that there are rungs, there are stages of evolution through which the psyche goes through. And each rung is defined by a different set of values and a different perspective uh, on the world. So all these stages that you can move up through if you're growing, if you're self-actualized, you're gonna be moving up this, this ladder. And at every stage has a different way of seeing the world. And so what's really important is for you to move up to stage yellow. Stage yellow is a pretty high stage in the spiral dynamics model, and that's all characterized by systems thinking. So this is the first stage, and I'm not gonna go into all the other stages, you can see my other episodes on that. Uh, but the stage yellow, what is different about it is that it's for the first time aware of the fact that there are stages. It's gotten to the point where it starts to see the world in terms of systems. And so a lot of what I'm gonna be talking today is gonna be uh, a very um, detailed characterization of what it's like to look at the world from a stage yellow perspective. Now, if you're at the lower stages, you might not find it immediately palatable. You might not see the benefits of seeing the world this way. Well, that just means you're gonna to need to grow to it. And what Spiral Dynamics tells you is that there is a very linear path that one grows through as they evolve in their consciousness and their in their development. And so if you wanna to grow to the highest stages with self-actualization, then you're gonna to have to evolve yourself to stage yellow. You're probably not at stage yellow right now. Maybe you're able to just tap into it barely. But the more you study systems thinking, the more you start to see the world through stage yellow glasses, then the more you're encouraging your psyche to, to evolve up this, up this hierarchy. And that's a, a really important thing because stage yellow is the first stage that's really reflecting on itself and becomes self-aware. And that becomes important because that allows you to avoid many of the disasters that befall you individually, but also us collectively by not being able to self-reflect and to see the world for the systems that are there. So another reason is to avoid disaster. Humanity is on a certain brink right now. And we're not sure what's gonna happen with humanity just in the next 50 to 100 years. There are many disasters that are looming and many of these disasters are not personal private disasters, they are collective disasters. They are disasters that stem directly from a failure to understand how the world is made up of systems. And we're trying to manipulate these systems but we're doing it with our blinders on without understanding that what we're doing is we're trying to manipulate systems. And so to just uh, perpetuate the survival of the human race, it might be important for us to all learn some systems thinking. So let's get into this. What is a system? A system is a set of interconnected things. So we can think of systems as elements. These are oftentimes physical things. And then the relationships or interconnections between these elements. These relationships are usually much less tangible. So it's harder for us to deal with them because they seem sort of abstract. And yet these relationships are more important than the elements themselves. So this is how we start to build a web, right? A web of, is built of things plus the connections that connect these things in a meaningful way. A system also causes its own behavior. Systems often behave in very complex ways. The more elements, the more connections, the more complicated the behavior. A system also has purpose. It serves a function. And it's very important to understand what the function is. The function is an even more important aspect of the system beyond the elements and the relationships. So as important as the relationships are in a system, the, the purpose of the system is even more important because that determines the general behavior of what the system is doing. And the most common purpose of systems is to protect themselves, to maintain homeostasis, and to expand themselves and to grow. Systems are highly ordered. And yet at the same time, they're also chaotic. Chaotic meaning that they're nonlinear and they're difficult to predict what's gonna happen with them. 
Systems are self-organizing, self-sustaining, and self-repairing. And systems respond to outside forces in complex ways. So if this is starting to resemble a life form or an organism, then you're definitely on the right track. Organisms, of course, are very complex systems. But there are a lot of other systems which are not just limited to biological flesh and blood and bone, which are also, really, you can think of them as organisms. A lot of corporations, governments, cities, states, collections of organisms, like entire ecosystems, you can think of all these things as sort of meta-organisms. And it's really not that important that these things are not made out of flesh and bone and living cells and DNA. You have to start to see from a larger perspective that these systems exhibit very similar characteristics to a living cell or to a living creature in that when you poke it, it'll run away or it will exhibit fear or anger or it'll lash out at you or it'll be defensive or it'll try to protect itself or it'll try to reproduce. And so this opens us up to this whole uh, possibility of these systems now evolving, over time changing. Language, for example, can be a system. You probably don't think of language as a living organism, and yet languages are highly ordered, highly structured. They have a purpose. They have elements. They have relationships. They are also self-organizing, self-sustaining, self-repairing. And they also respond to outside forces in complex ways, and they are also evolutionary. Language does not stand still. Just over a couple hundred years, language shifts, it changes. We know that when we try to read some Shakespeare, and we don't know what the hell he's talking about. And Shakespeare, that's only 500 years old. Nothing in evolutionary time. And yet, think of how much the English language has evolved over the last 500 years. Not to mention how language of of the larger language of humanity has evolved the last 2,000 years, you see? So this is where life gets really interesting is when we start to analyze these systems and get, get a sense of how they work. And it's really remarkable because it's like your mind gets blown by just the complexity and the ingenious design of all these things. And yet none of these things, when you look at it, were designed by somebody else sitting from outside. It's not like some man was sitting there and invented language. That's not how it happened. It's more like man was the substrate within which language evolved by itself. It's really self-organizing. No one man invented language, or even the ling English language, for that matter. So that's what a system is. Now you're trying to get an idea, and I'm going to give you a lot more examples as we keep going. But what isn't a system? Is everything a system? Well, not really. Not for our purposes. Scattered parts are not a system. So just rocks lying around on the ground, we're not going to consider that a system because they're not interconnected in any interesting, meaningful way. Books on a bookshelf, is that a system? Well, not really. Even though the books might be ordered in alphabetical order, it's not really a system because the books are not, again, in any kind of meaningful relationship with each other. They're not interactive. Trash in a landfill is also not a system because it's just lying there. It's sort of random and it's not really doing anything uh, interesting. Now, of course, you could make an argument and say, well, but the books and the trash in a landfill and the rocks, these do constitute physical systems. And that's true. They, in a certain level, are physical systems. And I'm sure there's interesting stuff to learn about a landfill and how it decomposes and all that kind of stuff. But for our purposes, we're interested in... Uh, in more juicy systems. So we're going to consider just scattered parts to not be a system. Understanding, though, that, of course, at the highest level, the entire cosmos is one giant system. So nothing escapes the entire cosmos's scope. And in that sense, it's all just one thing. But there's a, a lot of useful uh, benefit we get from breaking it down into smaller systems just to see how they work, and also to be able to manipulate them with our limited human minds. It's not very useful to think of everything as just one system. Now, let me give you some other examples of systems so that you get this really clear in your head, so it's not just abstract. A, a, a rainforest is a system. The human body is a system. An aquarium is a system. 
And actually, aquariums are really interesting. If you ever owned a saltwater aquarium especially, you know how complicated it is because you have all these different elements. You have to test the acidity, put various calcium and other supplements and minerals in there to make sure that your fish can thrive. There has to be enough oxygen, but not too much waste products from the fish. So your fish and your plants and your corals and your substrate, the sand, all of it has to balance out. There has to be circulation. So this is a very complex system in a little box. And if you get it wrong, all your fish die or all your plants die or there's too much algae or whatever goes wrong. So that's a really interesting little system that you can experiment with in your, uh, in your own home just to see how systems work. Of course, a city or a country is a system. A soccer team is a system. A corporation, any corporation, big ones like Microsoft or little ones, the economy as a whole, or economies of individual countries, currencies, these are all systems. A university is a system. A car is a system. The US military is a system. Public education is a system. The Facebook platform is a system. The Catholic Church is a system. Your business, if you have a business, or you're thinking of building a business, that's a system. And even if you are a one-man shop, where it's just you, and you're the owner and the, uh, the employee of the business, and nobody else works for you, that is still a system. In fact, that's what Actualize.org is. I'm basically a one-man shop. I don't have any employees. I do most of this stuff myself. Sometimes I hire a contractor here or there to help me. But otherwise, it's mostly just me. And it's still a pretty complicated system, Actualize.org. If you think about all the stuff that goes into it, it might seem simple. It's like, oh, you're just a few videos. But no, there's a lot of website stuff. There's a lot of backend stuff, backup systems, computers, servers, hard drives. Um, th there's a lot that goes into it behind the scenes that you don't see. And all that constitutes a pretty complicated system. The self, of course, is a system, by which I mean you, yourself. And I don't just mean your physical body. Of course, that's a system. And your physical body has subsystems within it, like the digestion system, immune system, cardiovascular system, so forth. But I mean you, your very psyche and who you most deeply feel that you are, your ego, your self-image, all your memories, all of that, all your beliefs, that is the self. That is a system. And then, of course, the entire cosmos, as I've already said, is the ultimate system. And everything else could be considered a, a subsystem within the ultimate system. So one thing you should immediately start to notice is that systems nest. And this is what gives systems such complicated behaviors, because you can have a system within a system within a system, plus these systems can overlap. In, uh, in complicated ways. So what I want to do now is I want to, I want to talk to you about the problems that we see within systems. And this is really going to the heart of why we want to study systems is because some of these problems are really bad problems that we want to fix as human beings because it's just not pleasant to live with these problems. What are these problems? Well, these are persistent systemic problems that have existed for thousands of years in many cases. And they're really difficult to stamp out. And that's because it's not the individual humans that are the problem so much as the system is creating these problems. So let's give you some examples. Poverty. How long have people tried to eradicate poverty? Forever, right? And it's still here with us. That's because it's a persistent systemic problem. The shrinking middle class, that's a systemic problem. That's not just a one isolated example. Every country around the world faces this problem of a shrinking middle class to various degrees. And it's always been this way since the beginning of human civilizations, thousands of years ago, you know, to various degrees, various times in history, this was less of a problem or more of a problem. And now like in America, we're facing this problem more and more. So this tells you that this is not a human problem individual human problem is a systemic problem. The environment, global warming, pollution, toxicity, the coral reefs dying, 
the ice caps melting, uh, these are all systemic problems. And these are not just new. Environmental problems have existed since, uh, since cities were first formed thousands of years ago. It wasn't global warming back then, but it was something else like, uh, you know, lead in your pipes uh, or disease in your water supply. Drug addiction is a systemic problem, and it's existed for thousands of years. War also existed for thousands of years. That's a systemic problem. Obesity, crime, lowbrow marketing. Have you noticed how difficult it is to market high consciousness things? And yet it's so easy to market low consciousness things. This is a huge problem that contributes to all the other problems we have. Small business funding, getting funding for a small business idea. That's a systemic problem. It's existed for thousands of years. Unemployment, education, fundamentalism, terrorism, corruption. These are all systemic problems. Depression is a systemic problem. We have a depression epidemic in the Western world these days. Huge amounts of people are getting depressed. Why is that? It's a systemic problem. Something in our system, something in our society is creating it. Endangered species, that's a systemic problem. Runaway materialism, that's created by our system. Partisan gridlock, that's created by our system. Spam, internet spam, whatever kind of spam you get, email spam, spam in your mailbox, physical mailbox, also gets spammed with flyers and leaflets and coupons. These are all systemic problems. And these problems, if you notice, they're very difficult to solve. We've been having spam now for uh, 20 years since the beginning of the internet. And there's more and more of it, and no one seems to find a problem, a uh, solution to this problem. So why is that? Well, because there's a larger system at work which we're not understanding. So I hope you can start to see the significance of working with systems because it allows you to address all of these problems that oftentimes we just like to sit back on our ass on our couch and say, oh, that stupid war, that stupid politician, look at that corrupt person, look at this crime, look at the obesity epidemic, look at the bad unemployment uh, numbers, look at the poverty, look at all this stuff. But it's not enough to just sit around on your couch and point fingers. You got to say, okay, what are we not understanding about these problems? Where are they coming from? What's creating them? What are the forces that work there? And then when you do that, now you start to um, really have a chance to change something for the better. So what I want to do now is I want to now go into the bulk of this episode and talk about the principles that define systemic thinking. So if you think along these lines, along these values, then you will be a systemic thinker. And if you don't, then you won't be. So firstly, we have to recognize that problems are systemic and not personal. This is a very important principle. This means it's not some Hitler or Osama bin Laden that's creating problems. It's not one or two or a thousand evil people that are creating problems in the world. It's systems. It's poorly designed systems that are creating these problems. So one thing this means is that to be a systemic thinker, you have to stop casting blame at other people. You have to stop calling things evil and start to ask yourself the question, okay, why? What is the larger meta operating principle here that's creating this? We have a drug epidemic, okay. It's not because the drug users are evil people. It's because of the environment. It's because of the bad education. It's because of the easy availability of drugs because of pharmaceutical companies or whatever, right? It's because uh, the media is serving up such low consciousness entertainment that people have nothing higher to aspire, higher to aspire to, so they just have nothing to do better than just to go do drugs. You see, it's a combination of all these factors, and I'm just, you know, I'm just scratching the surface of that one issue. It's a very complicated issue. So systems thinkers start to see that all of these issues are a lot more complicated than they think, uh, than 
we think when we start to look at them. Whether it's healthcare, the economy, taxes, drug problems, environmental problems, these are much larger than we assume. Another principle of systems thinking is seeing everything as a system. Now, of course, not everything deserves to be thought of as a system, but hey, a lot of stuff we're talking about here is highly systemic. So it's good if you're starting to move into stage yellow spiral dynamics to start to put on this sort of lens of like, that's a system and that's a system and that's a system. So like you're walking down the street and you start to see everything in systems. And that can be a phase that you go through. You don't ultimately want to be doing that for the rest of your life. But that's a good phase to go through for now. Another principle of systems is nonlinearity. Nonlinearity opens us up to chaos theory. Uh, that's a very complicated topic that I, also a beautiful topic. I wish I had time to go into it right now, but I don't, maybe in a future episode. But what nonlinearity means is that the really interesting stuff in life, it's not a simple equation like you saw in algebra class that had one or two variables. It has hundreds, if not thousands of variables. And all these variables affect each other. And what this means in practice is that playing the game changes the rules of the game. So a nonlinear system would be something, I mean, a linear system would be something like Monopoly. You're just playing Monopoly. We know what the rules are when we begin the game. That's linear. That's easy. We can deal with that. What's trickier is if we create a Monopoly game where one of the rules of the game is that halfway through the game, we can change all the rules. You see, this is tricky because now your strategy can't rely on the rules staying fixed. The rules will change and you have to take that into account. And that means a whole lot of unpredictability. That means that your system can take dramatic twists and turns and do 180 degree reversals. And that can surprise you. And this leads us to the other point, which is very important to understand about systems is that they're very counterintuitive. They don't work in a simplistic sort of like, I will pull this lever here and the stock price will go up. Or I will do this thing here and poverty will go down. It doesn't work that way. There are many, many factors affecting when poverty goes up, when drug abuse goes down, when war increases, when uh, uh, the education system improves, right? There's many, many complicated factors. And a lot of times, when naive people, people who do not understand system thinking, go into a system and start to muck around with it, they don't understand and appreciate the complexities of, of these systems. And so they just think like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna go in there and pull that lever and I'm just gonna get the result that I want. But oftentimes what happens is you pull that lever and you get the opposite result of what you wanted. And then of course you're stuck suffering the consequences. So that's a very good reason to study systems. So you don't suffer the consequences of uh, naive counterintuitive thinking. Nonlinearity means unpredictability and chaos. Chaos does not mean anarchy in the sense that anything goes. A chaotic system, like for example, the weather is not random. It doesn't just do whatever it wants. It follows physical laws and rules, but it's nonlinear, which means that you can't predict out too far into the future. And it can always surprise you, which is why weather cannot be predicted more than about 10 days into the future. Because any predictions further out than 10 days, they become meaningless because the weather can change so quickly, you see. But we can still predict the weather reasonably well, just as long as we understand the limits of our predictions. That's what chaos means. Nonlinearity also means that just because you have good intentions when you try to go in there and change the system does not mean really anything. And really the people with good intentions who are simple-minded try to go in there and change systems and what happens? We get the opposite effect. These people create evil rather than good. That's why a lot of good people create evil. And we've seen that throughout all of history because the problem was that they assume that, oh, my good intentions are enough. No, 
you also have to understand what the hell you're doing. And that means you have to study these systems and really understand how they work. It's a science. It's not anything goes. Another principle of systems thinking is that local actions have global impact. We can no longer just worry about our own little sphere here. Like if I have my company, all I care about is my company and my profits and my bank account and my employees and that's it. We can't think that way when we're doing systems thinking because we have to understand that my company is just one element within a larger system, the global economy or the national economy or the industry that my company is a part of. And so what my company does doesn't just affect my company and my pocketbook. It affects my industry. It affects my country. It affects the citizens uh, all over the world. It affects uh, employment rates. It affects taxes. It affects currencies. Right? It affects public opinion. So all these things need to be taken into account if you're going to run a successful company. Because if all you do is you build a local little company that only cares about itself, guess what? You're going to fail. You might succeed in the short term, but in the long run, you're going to fail because the world is becoming more and more global. And big companies now have to worry more and more about their global impact. You can't just say, fuck the world, and I'm going to do whatever I want because you're going to have a a backlash of public opinion against you. See, people will boycott you if you behave that way. So you have to start to think more globally, not just with companies, but with everything. You have to see how you or whatever you're doing fits into the larger systems that it's a part of. This requires broadening your scope. Another principle of systems thinking is becoming conscious of backfiring mechanisms. This is going along with that point about counterintuitiveness. Uh, a lot of times, what happens is that you change something in a system and it backfires on you. And you, as a systems thinker, quickly learn that the system is its own greatest enemy. What is the greatest enemy to the United States? It's not the Middle East. It's not North Korea. It's not even Russia. And it's certainly not terrorists. It's ourselves. And see, in fact, terrorists know that, which is why terrorists use this strategy. And the only way that terrorism works is if it gets the other person to react in a knee-jerk, unconscious fashion in such a way that that reaction backfires and destroys the system from within. See, the terrorists understand that. Terrorists are not going to be able to compete with the U.S. military face-to-face -face ever. Nor are they ever going to bring down the United States by killing all of its population or even 1% of its population. It's never going to happen. But what they can do is they can make strategic little attacks here and there, get people afraid, and then that fear will lead to a collapse uh, of the United States by making bad choices based on that fear and that anger which the terrorism has uh, incited, you see. So we have to become very conscious of this. And this issue of terrorism, for example, is one systemic problem which is very counterintuitive. A lot of simple-minded people think that, oh, well, we'll just bomb the shit out of the terrorists. That's going to solve everything. But no, this ends up backfiring. Because when you do that, of course, you kill innocent civilians. When you kill innocent civilians, of course, that makes it easier for the terrorists to recruit more people to their side. And then, of course, the more that happens, your problem gets worse and worse rather than better. So you need counterintuitive solutions to fix some of these counterintuitive problems. Starting to ring some bells? That's just terrorism. There's a lot of stuff like this. This applies to everything from education, to how your company is run, to marketing, to economies, to taxation, to healthcare. So many things. As systems thinkers, we learn that we are our own greatest enemies. I hope Actualize.org has shown you that, at least for yourself personally, that you are your own greatest enemy. And I hope that you're getting a direct hit of that as you're doing personal development work. The more you do it, the more you'll see that, man, 
He wasn't kidding. <laughs> I really am my own worst enemy. But of course, not just individually, but also collectively. The United States is its own worst enemy. We create all our own problems. Nobody else is creating the problems. It's very important to start to understand that because otherwise we're going to be stuck pointing our fingers outside of where the problems are. All the problems are really internal problems. Systems thinking also means that there are no easy brute force solutions. It's understanding that violent disruptive change to a complex system is going to create disaster. It's not going to fix it. You have to be very careful about overreacting to systemic problems because systems are all about balance and harmony. And when you don't understand that systems are about balance and harmony, maintaining a certain opposition of positive and negative forces, a system relies on both of these. Then you start to run into some of the problems that we're starting to see politically, for example, right now in the United States. Uh, the American populace thought that, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to elect Trump and Trump is going to be a disruption to the broken political system because, you know, politics filled with gridlock, a bunch of political insiders. So we're going to send in a guy who is completely inexperienced with politics and with government, and he will just magically somehow create the change we want, you know, turn the system around. But see, it's not turning out that way. And it's very obvious that it can't work that way because the United States government is a very complicated system. You can't just throw a grenade into a China shop and then expect a good result at the end. You're going to get chaos, not the kind of chaos I was talking about before. Here you you're going to get disrupt, uh, destruction, and you're going to get overreaction, and you're going to get a lot of backfiring, which is exactly what Trump is encountering. And that was very predictable to a systems thinker. It was obvious because Trump is the antithesis of a systems thinker. He does not honor any of the principles that I'm talking about here today in this episode. None. He breaks them all, which is why he's going to be a failure and a disaster because it's simply not going to work. Can you imagine going to a surgeon because you have a tumor in your head and you go to a brain surgeon and this guy takes the same kind of simplistic, violent, disruptive approach to your body that Trump is taking to the government? What's going to happen? Can you just take a scalpel and start to poke around randomly in your head? No, that's going to be disastrous. You have to know what you're doing because you're you're sticking your knife into an extremely complicated system, maybe the most complex system we know of on, on the planet, inside your skull, you know, your brain. It's so complicated in there. You have to know what you're doing. You have to study that thing, and you have to be very careful because every incision you make could end up uh, making the situation worse and not better. Another important principle of systems thinking is intuition and holism versus reductionism. This is a problem that we've seen in the sciences. We've also seen this problem in the universities, where a lot of scientifically minded, logical, rational people like to overanalyze everything and like to reduce everything down to physics. When you do this, what you're doing is you're taking a very complicated system and you're, you're only focusing on the materialistic, gross elements, and you're ignoring all the interesting relationships which really define the behavior of that system. Holism means that you see the thing as a whole and not just a bunch of parts. For example, if I take a human brain and stick it into a blender, blend it up, and then analyze the little molecules that are there in that brain soup with a microscope, I'll be able to see, you know, various molecules and cells and stuff, blood cells and neurons and neurotransmitters, but that is not going to tell me anything about the functioning of the brain or about consciousness or about emotions or about all the other interesting stuff that the brain does. To really understand the brain, you have to look at it holistically, how it actually works. You have to look at the relationships between all those elements. That's where the magic is, but reductionists, a lot of them like to reduce stuff down like, oh, well, yeah, the brain is just a bunch of neurons. 
And the neurons, are, they're just a bunch of atoms, and atoms are just a bunch of quarks, so everything is just a bunch of quarks, but then you lose something when you do that. You lose a lot. This is the danger of reductionism. As systems thinkers, we have to recognize that reductionism is not going to fly for fixing many of these world's high-level problems. You see? You can't just apply reductionism to something like poverty or to terrorism or to you know, environmental problems. You have to see these things holistically. Another principle of systems thinking is being aware of false boundaries. It's recognizing that in reality, there are no fixed boundaries in the universe. Boundaries are subjective things. We as human beings get to say where we draw which boundaries. Two different human beings could look at a group of ducks. One of them could say, well, that's one group of ducks. Another one could say, no, that's 10 individual ducks, which is true. Both, depending on how you look at it. See, you are deciding where to draw the boundaries. And uh, simplistic thinkers who are not at stage yellow of spiral dynamics, they tend to think that, no, there's 10 ducks there. That's objective. Or it's like, no, that's one group of ducks. That's objective. These boundaries are somehow defined within physics. But that's not the case at all. Systems thinkers understand that we get to define what the subsystem is that we're looking at within the entire cosmos. We get to draw the boundaries. And as systems thinkers, we understand this is a very important power because how we draw the boundary determines what we're going to see and then what potential solutions we might come up with. So just by redrawing the boundaries could give us the solution that we weren't seeing before because we were drawing our boundary too narrowly or too rigidly or it was too big or it was too small. So one of the powers we have as systemic thinkers is to go into a situation and say, okay, we've been looking at the situation like this, but what if we redraw the boundary so that we look at it like this? Ah, that gives us a better perspective. Now we get to see the true root problem and then we can come up with a decent solution. Another principle of systems thinking is that the world is dynamic rather than static. Simple-minded people think of the world as static objects. It's like, yeah, there's my car, my house, my country, my language, my body, my, uh, my beliefs. These are all static to a naive person. To a systems thinker, they understand that all of this stuff is constantly morphing and evolving. My body is evolving. My car is devolving. It's deteriorating every single day, right? I mean, this is true. Your car is changing every single day. The tires are getting worn out. The engine's getting worn out. Uh, the oil is getting dirty as you drive it. it. The car itself is becoming dirty as you drive it. Uh, your government is changing all the time. Your country is changing. It's growing. More citizens are being added. The world as a, as a whole is changing and evolving. Your job, your marketplace, your entire industry is changing and evolving. Certain industries are dying. Coal jobs are are out the window and they're never coming back. See? So all this stuff has to be taken into account because otherwise you have a fixed static mindset in a dynamic, complicated world. And that, uh, that just doesn't work. It's not reflecting reality. Even your language is changing. Every single year, these dictionaries like Merriam-Webster, they, they publish new words. New English words are invented every single year. Your beliefs are changing, your ideologies, even your religion. If you think that, well, the one thing I got is I got my religion, my good old Christianity. Well, guess what? You know how much Christianity has evolved over the last 2,000 years? It's virtually unrecognizable if you actually study the evolution of Christianity. It's very funny that a lot of modern Christians don't believe in evolution, and yet Christianity itself, their form of it, has uh, evolved to what it is today. Just even in the last hundred years, it's evolved so much. Totally different. Another important principle of systems thinking is complexity, nuance, valuing wisdom, and learning. 
So systems thinkers actually value complexity. They don't try to oversimplify everything. They value nuance. Not everything is black and white. They value wisdom and they value lifelong learning because they understand that all these systems are so complex that you need to be learning them all the time. Otherwise, uh, you're going to get stuck. Systems thinkers also understand that the power in working with systems is not in manipulating them directly, but in understanding them. You have to really understand the system. And that's where your solution lies. You don't just jump in there and start taking action without knowing what you're doing. This goes back to our point about sticking a scalpel into your brain. Right? You don't do that. You got to understand the brain. So a systems thinker will invest a lot of time just in understanding. Now, what this does is it makes the systems thinker look like a space cadet or an academic in the eyes of people who are at the lower tiers of the spiral dynamics model. So stage orange, stage green, stage yellow. When, I mean, yeah, stage orange and green and also stage blue, yellow is systems thinking. Uh, so blue, orange, and green, when they look at yellow, they look at yellow and say, man, why are you so obsessed with theory you're very much stuck in your head as a systems thinker. It seems just like armchair philosophy. That's what those stages will think of stage yellow. But that's just because they haven't evolved yet to the point of seeing the whole world as systems. And when they do, they'll say, oh my God, I need to learn so much more. There's so much I don't understand yet. And then they'll get to work cracking open the books, learning all this stuff and trying to understand it. Another principle of systems thinking is taking preventative action rather than fixing problems once they arise. It's being forward-looking. It's having a long time horizon. It's not just about next quarter's profits. It's about sustaining the company to grow and thrive in changing marketplaces 10, 20 years down the line. It's that kind of thinking. It's not just going to the doctor so that he can give you heart surgery because you spent the last 20 years eating terrible food. It's about taking preventative action. It's becoming conscious of when your body isn't looking good, isn't feeling good, and fixing it 20 years before you get to that heart attack situation. It's expecting unforeseen consequences of your actions. It's understanding that, hey, when I'm eating this cheeseburger, when I'm putting this French fries and this mayonnaise into my mouth, that has much larger consequences than just feeding my hunger or giving me some emotional boost or titillating my taste buds, right? Because the systemic thinker sees this from a holistic perspective. This is going to affect how much energy I have with my children. This is going to affect how long I live. This is going to affect how much money I spend on health insurance. This is going to affect my mood, whether I'm depressed or happy. This is going to affect my sex life. Uh, this can affect my confidence, myself. It's going to affect so much stuff. And that's just me. Not to mention the fact that, hey, you know, if I'm fat or if I have a heart attack and I'm a CEO of a big company, that's going to affect not just me, not just my family, but every single one of my employees. My entire company could suffer from that. And all of the family members of all my employees, all their children will suffer from that. The entire industry that I'm in will suffer from that. You see, so you start to see this kind of ripple effect of all your actions, and then you become very humble and you become very careful because you realize that every little thing that you touch could be a huge thing. So here, what comes with that understanding is admitting the unknown. System thinkers are humble in this respect because they see that these systems dwarf them. They dwarf your understanding so much that you have to be humble. You have to say, damn, I don't know. I don't know how healthcare works. I don't know how government works. I don't really know how terrorism works. Whereas simple-minded people, when they see a complex system, they assume, hey, it's easy. I know exactly how, I know exactly what the solution should be. Those stupid people in government, they're so stupid. We can fix healthcare in a week. That's what Trump thought. Trump thought that he can just go in there and hey, healthcare is a breeze. 
That's because he has no systemic understanding of anything, which is why he's going to be a failure. No matter how much he tries, he will be a failure because he's bringing a very simple-minded understanding of the world to places in the world like the U.S. government, which are extremely complex and nuanced and very systemic. And he's going to be very frustrated there because every move he takes is going to backfire on him. You just watch. Watch what happens. It's only going to get worse before it gets better. This also means self-reflection. Another thing that Trump lacks, self-reflection. System thinkers need to self-reflect because, hey, for a system to be able to function, and this is kind of where the element of consciousness or awareness comes into play. You know, I say in a lot of my past episodes, I say that. Awareness is the solution. Consciousness, raise your consciousness, that will solve many of your problems. Why is that the case? Because, like we said before, a systems thinker understands that the system creates all of its own major problems. So how can you solve your own problems when you can't reflect inside yourself to see what your own structural problems are? You see? And this, of course, for Trump is a problem, not just collectively, as he's running the government, it's also going to be a problem... Well, it has been a problem for him personally in his own life, in his own development. You can see the man has no self-reflection, which, of course, reflects in how he governs, how he interacts with people, and why all that stuff is disastrous. Why it's disastrous in business, it's disastrous in government, it's disastrous in your marriage, it's disastrous in your personal life, it's disastrous with your health, all across the board. Without self-reflection, you're going to die. Every system that is not sufficiently self-reflective is a dodo bird. It is not going to be able to compete. Self-reflection wins out self-reflection. Higher consciousness is what evolution is pushing towards. So it's, it's not going to work. It can work in the short term, but it will never work in the long term. Another principle of systems thinking is looking for the root causes of issues rather than the superficial aspects. A lot of people get caught up in the flashy and emotional superficial aspects. Whereas systems thinkers can see through that, they don't get caught by the red herrings. So another great example of this is with terrorism. A new election comes around and what happens? The Republicans pull out the old red herring Oh, the terrorists are coming to kill us and blow us up and all this. And look at the bomb attack last week in the news and that other bomb attack and 20 people were killed, 50 people, 100 people can look at this and look at the terrorists they're recruiting and all. See, this is all an emotional herring. Yeah, it might be true that there was a bad bomb attack and that's a very sad thing. But also you have to understand as a systems thinker that these are the superficial aspects. This is the fear. This is the emotional stuff. A system thinker has to say, wait a minute, but what are the root causes? What actually causes terrorism? Let's take a look at that. And some people say, oh, well, that's Islam. That's just Islam. We got to get rid of Islam. No, that's not it. It's not that superficial. It goes a lot deeper than just Islam. Now, I don't want to get into that. That's a politically charged topic that I really don't want to get into here. I just want to start to point out to you that notice how in the public, when it comes to climate, when it comes to corporations, when it comes to tax policy, when it comes to all the governmental policies, every single one of them, that they are all mired in these red herrings of emotional superficial aspects. And that's all pretty much what happened in the U.S. Uh, 2016 election. We didn't talk about the real issues of anything, nothing, not the real issues of climate change, not the real issues of the economy and the shrinking middle class, none of these things. The real issues were not addressed. Only superficial stuff. Little sound bites. And that's done largely so that nothing can be changed. That's actually how our politics works. That's one of the systemic problems of our political system is that we talk about the superficial stuff and we just trigger people's Low consciousness emotions push their anger and fear buttons and their outrage buttons and their ideological buttons. We push all those buttons so that they don't really think very critically and systemically about these issues because there are larger corporate and uh, political interests at play which are vying for power. And they do not want average people to 
to know anything about that. Just worry about the superficial stuff. Worry about your terrorists while we uh, <laughs> rob the country blind and take all the power for ourselves. You see, this is a classic game that has been played for uh, since the beginning of civilization. This is not unique to uh, the 21st century American government. This, is, this has gone on since the days of the Egyptians and the, the Greeks and the Romans and everything up till now. It's been this game. So you distract the simple-minded people with red herrings, and then nothing changes, and the status quo gets maintained. And that's how the larger system maintains homeostasis. That's good for the larger system, but it's not good for, uh, for progress and evolution. Another important principle of systems thinking is concern for balance. I've already touched on this, but systems thinkers really appreciate the yin-yang aspect of life. They see that even things that look like evil forces are not just evil forces. That systems often have many opposing forces. And that the greatest danger to a system is actually eliminating all the opposing forces until you only have one force. When you only have one force without anything holding it back, nothing to retard its growth, then you have an explosion of infinite growth. An explosion of infinite growth Another way we can think of that is a cancer. You have a cancer. And in a sense, that's what humanity is becoming now on this earth, is we're becoming a cancer that's uh, growing too fast for our own good, and we might annihilate ourselves just because. We fail to understand that we need to balance all these things. We need to balance population growth. We need to balance corporate greed. We need to balance the power that wealthy people have in society. If you don't do these things, the thing will collapse and self-implode. And this sort of appreciation of balance also leads to uh, an appreciation of the nature of wisdom. Or, I mean, the, uh, I said that backwards, the wisdom of nature. Because, again, simple-minded people don't appreciate nature very much. More uh, nuanced people start to see that nature, natural systems, the systems of nature, like rainforests, coral reefs, water aquifers even to a certain extent like tribal populations that there's a certain natural wisdom that's there that a lot of times when we build an uh, egoic western civilization the ego discounts some of this natural wisdom for example with uh, a good example this is pharmaceutical drugs right we make all these uh synthetic drugs not appreciating the natural herbs and supplements and medicines that are available in indigenous cultures all around the world. We don't care about those. We care about manufacturing these synthetic drugs that we can patent. And then we give these antidepressants to people by the millions and then they get hooked on these antidepressants or on these opiates, these very powerful synthetic opiates. And then um, that just makes their, their depression and their anxiety and all that stuff even worse because now they got an addiction on top of that. That's a failure to appreciate the, the wisdom of nature. And this happens in many ways. So it's not just about the environment. Of course, that's important. But it's uh, appreciating the delicate balances within ecosystems, with endangered animals, with uh, fish populations in the ocean, you know, so that we can sustain and feed ourselves on fish and not outfish the whole ocean. So there are all these different um, elements come into play there. Another important principle of systems thinking is having a global concern rather than a, a local tribal concern. Simple-minded people are tribalistic. And systems thinking is anti-tribal because it's integrative. It integrates the whole thing. Global concern for the entire species. We don't make distinctions between people. We see all people as basically the same. And not just people, but even animals. And even the environment, we start to see that all of this is important. We can't just say that people are the only important thing on the planet. And we certainly can't say, well, only America or only Germany or only a certain race of people is the only important one. So you can't do that because we've seen throughout history that when you do that, you ignore the larger dynamics that are going on and it's ultimately unsustainable. 
That's why slavery wasn't sustainable. Maybe it was a good idea for the white people in the South, but it wasn't sustainable, could not be morally sustained. They were conquered in a war for that reason. It was morally unsustainable, and they were not appreciating that. See, they didn't think about it that way. They didn't think about it like, oh, oh yeah, we can have these slaves, but what's going to happen when uh, people are outraged by the cruelty that we inflict on these slaves? I mean, maybe we're cool with it, but maybe we're going to get outcompeted and ultimately destroyed in war because uh, of this cruelty that we're inflicting. See, that would be systemic thinking. But of course, slave owners weren't very good systemic thinkers. See, they were tribalistic. Systems thinking is all about uh, seeing situations as democratic and egalitarian and as humanistically as we can. Because we recognize that anything other than that is not sustainable. You cannot run a sustainable dictatorship these days on the planet. It's not going to last for more than 100 years. What also comes along with this is the principle that materialism is not the only game in town. And in fact, success is not the only goal. And it's not even the most important goal. Never-ending growth is not what humanity is about. Because if it is, then we're just a cancer. Growth at all costs is just a cancer. And the cancer ultimately kills itself. So systems thinkers need to understand this. They need to understand that there are, there's a much bigger game being played here in life than just growth or just success or just raising our gross national product or just everyone having a house and a car. There's much more to the game of life than that. They also need to understand when enough is enough. And just ever increasing velocity is not what we're doing here in life. That's not what humanity is about. A system thinker is very concerned about sustainability. Every system that he or she looks at they always ask themselves, is this sustainable? Is this dictatorship sustainable? Is the war on drugs sustainable? Is our deficit sustainable? Are these tax rates sustainable? Is this business model sustainable? Is my marriage sustainable? Are the lies that I'm telling myself about my personal development, are they sustainable? When you look at that, in a lot of situations, they'll be shocked to discover that, wow, it's not sustainable at all. I can clearly see how, if this continues, we're going to go crashing right into the ground. And then you can start to ask yourself, well, how do we make it sustainable? How do we re-engineer the various elements, relationships, and forces of this complicated system? How do we redraw the boundaries? How do we widen our scope? How do we see this thing from some new perspective? How do we raise our awareness so that sustainability then becomes part of the system? Notice that some systems are sustainable and others are not. So what's the difference there? Well, that's something worth studying. Another principle of systems thinking is recognizing the dangers of self-interest. People generally that are Stages below stage yellow in the spiral dynamics, they're not very good at seeing the dangers of self-interest. They are mostly serving their self-interest blindly without self-reflection. Of course, you see this with Trump very clearly, but you also see it collectively. Because see, don't make the mistake of me picking on Trump as though Trump is a bad person. He's just a very good example uh, that we have right now in, in, uh, in the public mindset that we can draw attention to. But you also have to wonder, Trump, where did he come from? Did he create himself? Or is he the product of a system? What is the system that created Trump? Ah, interesting, see. A systems thinker is not blaming Trump for being Trump. A systems thinker is asking the bigger meta question of like, what created Trump? How many other people are there out there 
who are like Trump that you never even see, that are behind the scenes, running all sorts of corporations, businesses, governments, you name it. Kind of a scary thought, huh? How many of those people there might be? Because you understand that Trump is just a product of a system. He's a victim as much as anybody. Because what? where'd it come from? Well, it's a sort of materialistic, stage orange, success-oriented mindset that he has. And this has been indoctrinated into him through his upbringing, through his family history, through the place he grew up in. Uh, I guess that was New York or wherever he uh, got his chops, right? The kind of business environment that he was in. So somehow he learned how to run business in this sort of ruthless fashion, this non-self-reflective manner, growth at all costs, see? So that was a product of our culture. And American culture right now is suffering and suffocating because of this. Because look at Wall Street. Look at these giant corporations who are just um, lining their pockets with money. Like Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Google. These corporations are going to become a huge problem for us in the future. We think that these are just innocent corporations right now. Google might seem like a good corporation, but what, what happens in 50 or 100 years when the founders are dead, long dead, and you have uh, a manager running Google for maximizing profit. Oh boy, you better watch out. That's gonna, that could create a global catastrophe right there. Because these companies like Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, they have so much money, so much power. If they really wanted to use it, they could do some real damage. So system thinkers understand that self-interest whether it's corporate self-interest or government self-interest or religious self-interest, that this is ultimately tribalism. And tribalism is not going to work in the larger system of the entire planet. This means recognizing problems like the tragedy of the commons. I'll talk about that in the future. Uh, studying things like arms races. Why do we have arms races? And arms races, of course, are not just nuclear arms races, but there are arms races that happen with corporations, with lawsuits, patent lawsuits these days between giant corporations are an arms race in and of themselves, political arms races. So starting to study all of these becomes important. And generally, you start to come to the conclusion as a systems thinker that, hey, we need to include everyone into our solutions. Because if we exclude somebody, those people will get pissed off, they're going to rock the boat, and ultimately they're going to destabilize and break our system. So it's not really a solution unless it includes everyone. Also, it means being conscious of systemic addictions. Addictions are not just personal things, but they're also collective things. A nation could be addicted to oil, could be addicted to low taxes, could be addicted to subsidies, could be addicted to growth. And these are all very serious addictions that we face today with our government and with many of our corporations. And these need to be addressed. And we need to see that these addictions are not just because the company is evil. We have to look at the larger environment. How do we change the larger environment so that companies are not so damn evil and so selfish and so money hungry and so uh, growth oriented that they're virtually cancerous? How do we change the rules so that that doesn't happen? Systems thinkers think about how to think. It's like meta-thinking. It's self-reflection. Systems thinkers also recognize that changing paradigms is a huge leverage point for changing systems. Many times, the biggest problem that is keeping a bad system in place is a bad paradigm. And these paradigms are intangible things. It's sort of like a framework or a set of beliefs that you look at the world or like a lens that you look at the world through, right? Most people completely disregard the power of their beliefs, their ideologies, and their paradigms. They think this stuff is just like, oh, it's, it's just some mind stuff. You know, mind stuff's not important. What's important is money. What's important is military power. What's important is oil. What's important is killing terrorists. You know, that, they think of it in this very kind of gross way. Whereas actually a systems thinker understands that shifting one's perspective is highly significant 
It's not armchair philosophy. It's not just something for academics and colleges. By shifting our perspective, we can see the problem in a way that there is a solution. Some things, when you're looking at them from some paradigm, are completely unsolvable. For example, the mind-body problem. A lot of scientists are wasting their fucking time right now in universities arguing over the mind-body problem, and philosophers as well, and they've done this for hundreds of years, they've argued about the mind-body problem, they don't understand that their whole paradigm is backwards. You're never gonna solve the mind-body problem through a naive realist paradigm. It's never gonna work. On the other hand, you shift your paradigm, you realize that everything is consciousness and that the brain is not creating consciousness, but that consciousness is the location of the brain. When you realize that, the whole problem is solved. It's amazing. But see, that takes a paradigm shift and making those paradigm shifts are the hardest things because it means you have to change your web of beliefs, which of course, most people don't want to touch. Systems thinking also means integrating multiple perspectives. You go out of your way to survey many perspectives and then you integrate and bring them all together because you realize that every perspective has a tinge of truth to it. This doesn't mean all perspectives are equal. Some can be very misguided, but even the super misguided ones, go study Nazis and you will find a tinge of truth in some of their perspectives. See, a simple-minded person says, oh, Nazis, I can, there's nothing for me to learn from Nazis. There's nothing for me to learn from terrorists. There's nothing for me to learn from, from a pedophile. There's nothing for me to learn from this, from that. I'm gonna only study the good stuff, the stuff that agrees with me. That's a very simple-minded way of looking at the world. What I do is I gather all the perspectives, I try to see the truth there, bring it all together, understanding that there is no one true perspective. Also, this means that as you're integrating multiple perspectives, when you're coming up with your solution, you have to accommodate the values of various people that are out there. You can't just be serving your own private values because you're not the only thing around in the world and other things out there that are out there, they will object. People, things, governments, corporations, animals, they will object to your values. See, you have to find common ground there. And you have to be very open-minded as you're studying these multiple perspectives because a systems thinker knows that some of these perspectives are nasty, ugly, horrible on the surface or they seem false. There's no way this perspective could be true. And I can't see how it could be true. But a system thinker understands that, hey, I can't know what I don't know. I have to be open. I have to do an honest investigation. And only then will I know. Whereas simple-minded, non-systemic thinkers, they assume they already know which perspectives are good or bad before they've actually adopted them and tried them on for themselves. And this, of course, leads to a huge uh, blind spots. Another principle of systems thinking is studying patterns and cycles. You recognize that many of these systems are cyclical. They oscillate. They grow through, they go through, you know, noticeable phases. And studying these phases and patterns becomes important. Business patterns, government patterns, ideological patterns, even patterns in your own life. You know, your own life goes through cycles. It can be useful to study the cycles of a human being's life because then you know what to anticipate. This is true science. You're studying how these systems work in reality, not how you think they work, but how they really work empirically. It also means studying systems versus manipulating them. So if you get eager to go manipulate a system, I encourage you to pause and really think about it. Think a good long while before you manipulate anything because it might easily backfire on you. It also means studying feedback loops because you're going to see as a systems thinker that a lot of the systemic problems are caused by poor feedback loops where feedback is not clear or it's too long delayed. There's not a quick enough feedback. So the people in your corporation aren't getting the feedback quickly enough to fix the problems that are there. That could be fixed if you just fix the feedback loop or the wrong kind of feedback is being given. So that's uh, in a nutshell 
what systems thinking is. You get a pretty good idea. It's still only an introduction. We're still just skimming the surface, but you can see how deep of a field this is. You can spend years studying this stuff. And uh, I think you should if you're interested in uh, changing the world for the better. How do you know if you're a systems thinker? Next time you're sitting in traffic, big old traffic jam and you're pissed off, Rather than being pissed off and blaming the guy in front of you for the traffic jam, you wonder to yourself, why is there this traffic in the first place? What is the systemic problem causing this traffic? Is it the number of lanes? Is it the speed limit that's posted there on the side that I saw? Is it too slow? Is it the stoplight? Maybe there's too many stoplights, too many intersections. Maybe there's not a highway nearby or vice versa. Maybe there's too many highways in this area and the way that they're converging is causing this bottleneck. See, when you start to think of every mundane problem in the world in that fashion, that's when you know you've really become a systems thinker and now you're at stage yellow. This is how stage yellow thinks. They see the whole world like this. And this gives them a certain tranquility because they're no longer going around blaming people. They're actually much more pragmatic. They're solutions oriented. They're interested in understanding the actual problem rather than the superficial pointing my finger at somebody. Now you might say, well, Leo, this is all well and good, but you know, why should I care about changing the world? I'm just interested in improving myself. I want to get my little family. I, got, I want to get my little business going and earn some good money, and that's all that I really care about. Who cares about changing the world? You're talking about these big things, government, taxes, terrorism. Like, I'm not going to change any of this stuff. Well, look, then what you're admitting here is that you're admitting that you're a useless human being. That's what you're admitting. Understand this. Because you're saying that all you care about is your personal pleasure and satisfaction and your own personal private success. And you're not tying that success or pleasure to anything of value that you're contributing to the world. You're expecting that stuff to just kind of be given to you because you go in there and you work for eight hours a day, but your work is not directly tied to actually improving the world. What that means is that you will be eliminated. You will go extinct. You are like the dodo bird. It's only a matter of time. You understand this? Your ability in the future to get paid, to make a good living, will be directly proportional to how creative you are as a systems thinker and the kind of challenges that you're out there solving for the world. If your work is not solving meaningful world problems, you will get eliminated. You will not be successful. You will be miserable. And you will be wondering, just like those coal miners, hey, where are my coal jobs? I need my coal job back. Because you're just expecting somebody to provide you with employment. And you're not thinking about, hey, hey, this thing I'm doing, by digging a fucking coal, I'm destroying the environment. Yeah, it's good for me and my family, but there's 7 billion other people around who don't want to be breathing coal. And there's solar companies and wind companies and all this innovation happening all around you, but you're, uh, I just want my coal. I just want to make coal and bring home a paycheck. Well, you know what? Fuck you, because you're a selfish bastard. That's what you are. You're not thinking ahead. You're not being creative. And so, therefore, you are being eliminated. I'm sorry to say that that's what's real. And that's not just going to happen with coal. That's going to happen with everything. We're living in a society where change is accelerating every single fucking year. Change is accelerating. You need to be on your toes. You need to be learning, educating yourself. You need to be on the cutting fucking edge or you will go extinct. That's what's going to happen. And before you go extinct, you will be very miserable. Extinction does not just mean your physical death. You will be miserable in many other ways. You're not going to have the satisfaction of contributing meaningfully to humanity. 
That's an enormous satisfaction. I get that every single day. It's a huge component of my happiness in my life. You're not going to have that. You're foolish if you're turning that down. See? Not to mention that you're contributing to many of the world's greatest problems and that you might directly lead to the destruction of the human race. That's what might happen. When you blindly go about working for somebody, what's most likely going to happen is that you're going to be working for a cancerous corporation, which is contributing to a cancerous society, which will ultimately lead to a cancerous end to this little experiment of life that we are a part of. So start thinking of bigger challenges than yourself. This is counterintuitive. You think that thinking about yourself is going to get you everything you want, and actually it's the exact opposite. Thinking about the world and virtually paying no attention to yourself is what's going to really grow you the most and give you the most fulfillment and satisfaction in life. So be careful about your intuitions here. Understand that the world is at a precipice. We're in a dangerous place. And in a sense, it could be a bad thing or it could be a great thing because we have a great opportunity for redemption. The world needs you to help fix some of these very big and important challenges that we have, these systemic thinking challenges. And to do that, you need to turn inside yourself and make yourself a systems thinker. That's it. I'm out of here. Please click the like button for me. And come check out actualize.org right here. My website, I have resources there, my life purpose course, my book list, and the forum, my blog, and many other things. Wait one second before you go about my book list. On my book list, I recently added two incredibly important books for systems thinking. They're all about systems thinking. So if you have the book list, go check those out, buy them, read them. They're very important. It'll build on everything I talked about here. And... Uh, if you don't have the book list, then I recommend you uh, check it out because I think you'll get more than its cost in value just from reading these two books about systems thinking, not to mention all the other amazing books that are there. All right, that's it. Stick with me for more in future.